Hello and welcome. My name is Sudhanva and I'm uh, an editor at Leftward Books and I also work with Vam Prakashan. Both of these are publishing houses based in New Delhi and today we are meeting because uh, it's the 150th anniversary of the defeat of one of the great socialist experiments in the history of humankind. Um, one of the things that we are told again and again, um, you know, why is it that we can't build it, uh, a new world, a different world? Why is it that capitalism is supposed to be the end of history in the sense that there's no further social development or a new mode of production that's possible? Um, is because it is alleged that, you know, socialism or communism is bound to fail. Now, you might think that uh, the fact that we are meeting today on the 150th anniversary of the defeat uh, of the Paris Commune might, in fact, reinforce this belief. But actually, if you think about it, it doesn't. Because the times that we are going through right now, the last year and a half, maybe, of the pandemic actually underlines, underscores the fact that the whole world is gasping for socialism, that you cannot have a situation where millions of people across the world are suffering because of a lack of basic medical facilities, because of a lack of, uh, of medicines or vaccines or hospital beds, and literally a lack of air. Now, what can solve this problem? It's not capitalism that can solve this problem. What can solve this problem is socialism. And the reason why we, are, why we are meeting today on the day of the collapse of, uh, uh, on the day of the anniversary of the collapse of the Paris Commune is because 150 years ago, the workers of, of Paris breached or tried to breach the gates of heaven, in a sense. They tried to take the state in their own hands and run the first worker state. Uh, in the history of the world. Well, uh, not literally the first, but whatever. We won't go into, um, into those details. That experiment failed. But in the failing of that experiment, in the failure of that class struggle, lay great lessons for the working class to build, the, to build socialism for the future. Today, if you go to the website of Left Word Books, which is mayday.leftword.com. You can buy this absolutely incredible, beautiful book called Paris Commune, 150. It's got, uh, um, it's got writings by Karl Marx, by Vladimir Lenin, and by Bertolt Brecht, a poem by Bertolt Brecht. It's got a wonderful, beautiful short essay by Tings Chuck, and it's got an introduction by Vijay Prashad. If you go to the home page of mayday.leftword.com, you can see this book. You can buy the book and download it. And if you use the coupon code Paris Commune at the, on the checkout page, then you can even get a discount on your purchase. Now, with that, let me invite the first speaker for the day today. That's my friend and colleague, Vijay Prashad. He's the chief editor at Leftword Books. He is also the executive director of Tricontinental Institute of Social Research. Welcome, Vijay, and over to you. Well, first, it's uh, great to be here. It's the 150th anniversary of the Paris Commune's defeat. But as we learned from Lenin, Lenin's um, immense contribution to our understanding of the Paris Commune um, experiment there is no defeat for the working class. Every defeat, as it were, is a school for the next great attempt at rising. And in fact, on the one day after 72 days, on the 73rd day of the experience of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1918, Lenin left his offices in the Smolny building in, in Petrograd and went out into the snow and danced because he said, we've made it one day more um, than the Paris Commune. And then, of course, the next experiment will make it one day more and another day and yet another day. Paris Commune lasted 72 days. 
Um, two days later, Marx drafts a very important text, which later gets published as Civil War in France, where he assembles the lessons from the Paris Commune. And the most important lesson, of course, the most important lesson is that this is a revolutionary development led by the artisans, led by the working class. There was no bourgeois leadership as there had been in the 1848 uprisings in Europe, as there had been in the 1830 uprising in Europe, as there had been, of course, in the 1789 Paris uh, French Revolution. At the French Revolution, it was a cross-class phenomena, but the bourgeoisie played a role in a very confused environment, which at some points included leadership by the artisans, the Jacobins and others, but others, of course, um, the bourgeoisie taking control finally with Napoleon, and then he crowns himself as Napoleon the first. But in the Paris Commune 1871, there was no bourgeois leadership. This was the working class not only seizing power, and here's the key thing, but reshaping the administrative apparatus of Paris, reshaping it so that um, different departments would be run in a different way. The basis of democracy was different. Every office was elected, including the judiciary. You see, this is the great trick the bourgeoisie plays on human civilization by saying we need an independent uh, judiciary. Essentially, an independent judiciary is a judiciary often nominated by the bourgeoisie. In this case, the judiciary was elected by the people. Every post had the right of the people to recall the officer. If you're not doing your job, then there's a procedure to recall the officer. They tried to democratize all of society. It was a remarkable achievement only in 72 days. Imagine this. The Paris Commune lasts only 72 days. That's incredible. The kind of things, innovations done by the people. And when they were crushed, they were crushed by brute force. When the Versailles army arrives, devastates them. There's carnage, thousands of workers killed, many hundreds of leaders sent into exile. That's the first great lesson of the commune. The second great lesson of the commune is the commune didn't begin in 1870 when um, the French were defeated by the Prussians in a great war, a great and ridiculous war at the same time. That wasn't the beginning. It didn't begin in 1871 on the uh, 18th of March. It did not begin when the communards took um, the city hall and put up the red flag. It didn't begin there. It began in the French Revolution of 1789, it began in the 1830 uprising, it began in the 1848 uprising, and crucially, it began in 1868, when the old veterans of 1848 began to meet in reunions. You see, under the dictatorship of Louis Napoleon, political activity was forbidden in France. So under the guise of reunions, they started to meet and at each of their reunion meetings, they used to chant Vive la Commune. And at the end of the reunion meeting, they'd say Vive la Commune. It began years before they prepared the terrain. In these meetings, they discussed things. What is the role of women in the factories? What is the role of judiciary? What is the role of who's going to clean the streets? How should our houses look? Why do we, why can't we eat? They discussed all these issues. They created a program a working class program. When you read Marx's text, which we have in this selection, when you read Marx's text, what you're reading is the theory of the working class brought to the surface by Marx. It's an essential text, and I hope very much you read it. Well, one of the key findings after all this, of course, is that the workers can take the state but not inherit the old state. The old state has too many habits of the bourgeoisie. The old state has too many habits of feudalism. A new state structure has to be created. And that's precisely what the workers started to do. That's an elementary lesson, which Lenin writes about in his commentary on Marx's text, Civil War in France. This is the chapter in Lenin's text from 1918, State and Revolution, and it forms part of our text. I'm going to close here telling you a little bit about this remarkable project of the International Union of Left Publishers. 
for this particular text, which you can download on several websites in several countries, 27 publishers have come together in 18 languages to put together this book. You know, that is a considerable feat of internationalism. The publication of this book today is itself a contribution to the advancement of the goals of the Paris Commune. The publication of the book itself is a contribution to the advancement of the goal of the Paris Commune. We're trying to create an internationalist sensibility, not this narrow vaccine nationalism age we live in, not this narrow nationalism of drink cow urine and Corona will run away. Not that kind of nonsense. We live in a world which demands internationalism and the Paris Commune, although it took place in Paris, was an internationalist event because when the idea of the communards went to Algiers, the Algerians rode up, rose up. When the idea of the communards went to New Caledonia, as far away as New Caledonia, the Kanak people rose up. They formed a commune. Later, there will be communes all over the world. People trying desperately to take charge of their life, not in a narrow way, not in a small way, but in an internationalist way. Vive la commune. 150 years and forever. Thanks a lot. And that art came out of this just absolutely gorgeous. I, I just have to share this with you. Sorry. Um, yeah. So all of these, uh, all of these images that you can see in uh, in tiny size, are all submissions that were made for uh, for an international exhibition that uh, that Tings and uh, and other comrades had organized uh, to try and come to you know what would be the cover design uh, of this book uh, artists from all over the world contributed to it uh, and all of this was sort of shepherded uh, by things so well over to you things uh, and then after this we are going to have a conversation between things and the artist who has contributed the back cover uh, of the book which i'll just very quickly i'll I'll bring it up. The back cover of the book, absolutely gorgeous with this rising sun. Yeah. Uh, and that's been contributed by Comrade Junaina Mohamber, who's also, uh, uh, you know, a, a speaker today, and things and, uh, and Junaina are going to be in conversation. So thanks, over to you. Thank you, Sundanva, and thank you very much to Leftwood for this invitation. Um, it's absolutely an honor to share this evening with you all. Um, we've been remembering the last day of the 72-day worker strike, which I think we remember it as the passing of the torch to follow in the revolutionary footsteps of those communards that came before. But um, before I go deep into the exhibition and the process behind that, I just wanted to um, rewind a little bit before the last day, which is just 12 days ago, 150 years ago. So on the 16th of May uh, in 1871, um, the Vendome column in Paris came toppling down. So the communards had organized to take down this Napoleon era, era uh, imperialist symbol and in its place, they renamed the Plaza Place Internationale. So from this act, which was a cultural act really, um, was uh, an understanding that the fight to seize power for workers is also a fight over culture. It's also a fight over the institutions um, and also a fight over symbols 
uh, uh, the toppling of the old symbols to create um, uh, symbols of the new. Um, so behind this um, act, one of the masterminds of this is uh, was a French socialist painter uh, named Gustave Courbet, which some of you might have heard of. He was famous for doing this painting called Stonebreakers. It was like a realist painting, um, trying to really paint the sweat of the toil of workers, um, peasants specifically. So during the car, car, uh, commune, Courbet was also uh, elected, interestingly, uh, the Minister of Culture. Uh, he and the president of the Federation of Artists of the Commune. Uh, and this is something that we actually bring into the book as well, this cultural elements and also historical uh, moments um, within the, the Commune process. So 47 members came together, uh, painters, sculptors, architects, engravers, and decorative artists. Um, and they established a manifesto, which we actually have um, uh, translated into 15 languages, or 18 languages, and also um, republished in the book. Uh, it's it's kind of almost surreal to think that in the middle of the barricades, they were um, of a workers' rebellion. They were debating questions of like of of cultural patrimony, of cultural heritage, of arts education. Uh, how can we socialize the monuments or symbols or cultural products for the people and for the workers? Um, and I think this is a probably lesser told part of the Paris Commune history. Um, so very much they knew that the construction of a new society led by workers um, was this battle over the ideas and institutions and the cultural ideas that support uh, that worker state. So in this spirit, um, we approach the cover art of the book in a different way. Um, uh, the part of the art, um, art department, which I help coordinate, and also the communications department, to, I'll try Continental with the whole International Union of Left Publishers. We made an open call for art. Uh, we asked people to submit uh, cover uh, uh, proposals um, that help reimagine and visual, visualize the commune's history and what it means today for people's struggles and movements. And so with that, I'm just gonna share very quickly what we received. It's a very short video, but it's better than um, me explaining what actually we received. So let me just try here. I'm not sure if it's yet playing. Perhaps not, but I can share. Oh, Saranga will play. Thank you, comrade. So just very quickly, and I invite you all to have a look at the exhibition on the website at the, the tricontinental.org, where we've hosted the, uh, the contributions from 41 artists from 50 countries. Um, almost as many artists that uh, formed the Artist Federation in the commune. And it was a very difficult decision, um, as Vijay mentioned already, to choose the covers because there's such incredible art coming from all the regions of the world. Uh, and on the cover, we, we chose a work from uh, Jorge Luis Rodrigo's uh, Aguilar, who's from Cuba. And of course, we're joined today with Dunaina um, from uh, SFI and the Young Socialist Artist Group. We'll have a nice conversation after this. Um, and the exhibition was launched just a, um, a week ago on our site. Um, and I just wanna share quickly about how we tried to recover some of the cultural elements inside the design of the book, which was led by one of our designers, Danny from Argentina. And um, um, just to tell a little story about an, another communard that was part of the Artist Federation. Um, his name is lesser known than the actual song he helped create. His name was Eugène Poitier. Um, you, you probably haven't heard of him, but the song I'm sure uh, you all have, uh, which was the International, uh, which he actually wrote the, the, the lyrics to during uh, the commune, um, in the trenches of the commune, but then the song was completed from the ashes of the commune, let's say. And it's become obviously one of the most sung anthems of workers' struggles of the world. 
So how did we do this? We we collected uh, lyrics of the international to, in different publishing languages, from Tamil to Portuguese um, and to Hindi to uh, Spanish, uh, 12 languages. It was a nightmare for the designers, um, but we actually added the original sheet music and created that as a, used that as a design element. So as you actually flip through the pages of the book, uh, you the, the song completes itself through the 12 languages together. And another element we added is, you know, the following of the Bandom column, which I started this little um, chat with, is uh, we added a little animation element at the bottom of the page. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers those flip books from when you're uh, a child. So as you kind of read the book, you'll see the column slowly falling down. So as if you as reader are participating in the felling of the of the column. So the creation of new symbols, like the international, as you topple symbols of the old, the Vandom column. So I'm just gonna show another quick video uh, to show you the little bit of the inner pages of the design of the book itself. So to close this off um, the, a little, uh, I just want to share about an event that we did two days ago, um, and Janaina was also part of it, but we invited, we did a live event actually on Instagram, uh, we invited uh, different artists that participated in the exhibition to, to share a little bit about where they come from, what inspired them to do their work, uh, and also why they decided to think about the commune and, and, and reimagine the commune with us during the process. So Janaina came um, and we, we had a really lovely conversation and hope we can continue it after here about you know, what is the role of, um, of culture that emerges from struggles, from the barricades of Paris to the barricades of Delhi, like we've seen with the farmers' protests. We also have Federico from Argentina, uh, who was an abstract artist. And he told us about, you know we tried to remember Fidel Castro's quote that our enemy is not uh, as our enemy is imperialism, not abstract art. Um, we have Fabiola from Mexico from a youth organization named Hen. Uh, and she actually told us how the commune uh, had, a, had a legacy in the Mexican revolutionary process, especially uh, in the Comuna de Morales in the state that she comes from. We had another comment from India, Ramchandran, who was a longtime CPIM member and a retired factory worker and who has been a communist artist for longer than both of us have lived, that's for sure. Uh, we had Lena from the United States from the Party for Socialism and Liber uh, Liberation talking about you know, the different fruits of the commune that, uh, uh, that inspired different revolutionary processes. Um, and finally, we had Joe from South Africa uh, talking about how workers' history is a part of art history and, and how do we cover that. So it was, I think, a very fruitful conversation and a way for us to imagine that the process of building international working class, class culture um, is very much alive uh, in, in bringing, bringing forward this history of the Paris Commune and its 150th year anniversary. So now I'm here with Junana again. It's such a pleasure to be with you twice in a week, comrade. How are you? I'm fine, I'm really good. Excellent. Um, yeah, I'm hearing you fine. I hope everyone else is too. Um, I mean, maybe first of all, congratulations again, and thank you for your work for contributing it um, to this, not only the Paris Commune 150 exhibition, but also now is going to be printed as the back cover art um, in 18 languages, 15 countries, um, you know, sent to, to people all around the world. So it's pretty fantastic. Um, maybe you can tell a little bit about yourself um, you know, kind of who you are, where you're from, how how you ended up getting to know uh, the, the the Paris Commune um, book and the exhibition process. 
uh, I'm Junaina and I'm from Kerala, India. Um, so about myself, uh, currently I'm working in a company in Pondicherry. Uh, I have been a part of SFI when I was studying. And now I am a part of uh, this group called Young Socialist Artists. And uh, about uh, Paris Commune, uh, I have read about Paris Commune long before than this. And uh, a comrade Nidhi sent me this uh, call for artist notification. Uh, and I was already working in the election campaign during that time. And uh, I was very busy with my schedule. But uh, when Nidish, comrade Nidhi sent this uh, notification, I thought uh, I have to work for this. So, that was it. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about the Young Socialist Artists? What is this group and how did it form? Uh, actually, uh, we are a group of artists from all around India uh, who follow the left ideology. And I think uh, for me, this is the first time I'm being uh, a member of a group that is, uh, you know, a well constructed, uh, an organizational form. Uh, and I have been in a lot of groups where our artists uh, share their individual products and, uh, you know, where people uh, see art as a community. But here uh, we are building a community. Uh, and uh, as a group, uh, as an organization, uh, we are trying to contribute something uh, to support the ideology and spread its uh, way throughout India and if possible throughout the world. So in a way, the Young Socialist Artist Group is a bit of, um, I don't know, uh, similar to the Artist Federation in the sense that it grows out of struggle and tries to meet the needs and the questions that come out of the concrete struggles. I mean, we've been seeing the historic uh, farmers' protests and wonder if how much that has, has also inspired the work of yours, but also of the group. Yes, uh, I, I think in so many ways, uh, the farmers protest is similar to the Paris Commune. Like it's been almost six months now and we have more than 600 plus smart years now. Uh, and uh, in so many ways, people are protesting and uh, Paris Commune was just the beginning. It's still carrying on uh, through all of us. And I think so. Um, I'm just going to try to share my screen just so people can be refreshed with the art that you actually made. Uh, okay, maybe I am unable to share it on this platform. Um, but anyways, uh, one of the things, if people can see the... Uh, oh, you have it on your screen. Perfect. <laughs> maybe just a little center. Okay. So one of the things i mean i think when you're seeing the image is it reminds us of the um eugene, eugene de la croix painting liberty leading the people which was commemorating the 1830 French revolution you know the original one was a woman with a french flag um bare-breasted yes. leading the the kind of uh, revolution so why did you choose to reference this image um this painting and what were you trying to show in, in your piece uh, I think, uh, first of all, I wanted to portray a glimpse of the revolution itself, like uh, what uh, to visualize a scene from the bloody week or something like that. And then, uh, we know, uh, like, there have been so many people, like men, women and children, uh, thousands of them have been, uh, or communists have been uh, killed and, uh, during the struggle. So I wanted to portray uh, a woman uh, because uh, I think more than in uh, any other revolutions it's the first time and uh, women have been participated so much uh, so I wanted uh, a woman to be in the friend uh, so I uh, got the inspiration from the painting and drew that. Um, I also noticed that in the painting um, I mean, one of the, the, not only was the woman, the original one from Delacroix, the woman is wearing the little hat. I was trying to figure out how to pronounce it, but I think it's called Phrygian cap, you know, the, the triangle hat that falls. But I think you didn't actually include that one. Um, but uh, in the book itself, we mentioned a couple of times this hat and the symbol that became associated with liberty, let's say. But interestingly, Corbet, who was the founder, of, one of the founders of the uh, Paris Commune at Federation of Artists, he actually wrote just just days, I mean months, actually months before the Paris Commune, of uh, referring to this hat and how that they would cover the muzzles, the last can with this Phryg Phrygian hat, 
And then he said something really nice, is that the colossal moment, he was predicting what would happen with the Vandom column. Uh, in place of the Vandom column, we will, we will create a column of the people and for the people. So in some ways you've kind of taken the legacy of Corbeil and the artists of the, you know, the commune of the artists and reimagined it. Like uh, what would the new column of the people be? What would be the new art for the people be uh, while referencing the old? So I think it's a really beautiful work that you did. Thank you. Um, just wondering also, because you've, um, you know, obviously had to study a little of history while doing this work. Is there anything that you feel like you learned from the Paris Commune um, as an artist, as an activist today? Uh, as you mentioned before, there was uh, there were this group of artists that has been gathered in the commune, and uh, I think. Um, for today's uh, uh, society, we consider morely, uh, uh, consider art as a community, commodity. Like, uh, I think, I don't believe uh, art has more power than that. It has the this power to influence people in uh, so much, uh, in a very strong way, that rather than being just a commodity. So, uh, and uh, I have read that during that period, uh, art was, uh, you know, um, it was mostly visible through the elite class people only. It was uh, stored in national museums and uh, working class people were not able to see this. And I don't think art is uh, such a thing. It's universal. It should be allowed for all the people. And uh, it was very, uh, it is very important uh, for art being a universal thing rather than, uh, you know, a privileges, uh, rather than being something that can be uh, accessed by only the privileges people. Yeah, this is exactly one of the things that they were trying to um, debate in the barricades of the Paris Commune is the socialization of art that can be enjoyed by as a common good. In a similar vein, um, you know, when we did this call for solidarity artwork, um, we we put the exhibition online as a as a kind of common good to be shared for people to be able to download those posters, uh, look at those posters, share those posters, take them to the streets, take them to the barricades um, as a common good and, a, and as something that hopefully can be access, access to much more than, and, than in just a, you know, a, a gallery space in a conventional sense. So, I mean, with that, I wanted to really thank you. I didn't know if you have any other final words to share with, with people today. I encourage everyone to check out uh, Junaina's art as well as uh, the other 40 artists that contributed to the to the uh, Paris Commune exhibition at the tricontinental.org. Um, any last words with for us? Uh, it was really amazing to be a part of this, like uh, knowing that uh, like people from all around the world was contributing this thing. And uh, it was amazing to see that people uh, all around the world were sharing the same ideology as we do. And we it was really hopeful, hopeful to see that. Thank you for that, those words. And, and um, it was great to talk to you twice in a week. I hope same we can around very more and build our internationalist network of artists. <laughs>
I would also urge those of you who can afford it to actually buy the copy uh, from the Leftward website because, uh, you know, like everyone else, uh, all publishers have also had a tough year. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is one of the ways in which we try and recoup, um, you know, regroup our, uh, our resources and get back on our feet. So uh, once again, thanks very much, Tings and, and Junaina, for your art, for your design, and for this wonderful conversation. Next up, I'd like to invite uh, Comrade Dipshita Dhar. She uh, is a PhD candidate uh, at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, and recently, uh, she also contested the, uh, uh, the West Bengal elections and ran a very robust, a very spirited campaign um, in very, very difficult circumstances. Uh, I have known Comrade Dipshita as a fighter, as a militant uh, for many years now, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing her. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, Dipshita. Thank you. Thank you, comrades. Uh, thank you so much. It was such a engaging uh, conversation. I was following uh, from the time comrade uh, Vijay Prashad has started speaking and then this two young artists joined us in. And uh, I think it was very uh, interesting that, uh, you know, today we are actually uh, remembering defeat of a, of a revolutionary project, a project which uh, was not successful uh, in, its, in its very um, literal meaning. But even after that, we are uh, remembering it, we are celebrating it. And as Comrade Vijay Prasad has said, that every failure has given us some lesson. And today when uh, I, I speak this, or when, I mean, today when I'm sitting in Kolkata, I'm sitting in West Bengal, where we just faced uh, a defeat which was unprecedented for the very first time after the West Bengal assembly was constituted. This is the first time that the left does not have a single seat uh, inside the assembly. It's a it's a moment of uh, extreme sadness. Uh, it's, a, it's a moment of grief. But even after that, um, we have learned from our defeat. We have understood that uh, what went right and what went wrong. And uh, the, the lesson of hope, the, the hope is that even after being defeated so brutally, even after not getting uh, the people's support in the last election, our comrades, the comrades of CPIM, the comrades of SFI, DYFI, CIT, YDOA, from the very next day uh, of the election, they're on ground. Uh, we know we are going through a pandemic situation. There is scarcity of oxygen. There is black marketing of uh, hospital beds, nursing home beds, and the whole country is going through an extreme crisis situation. In that crisis situation, it's our comrades from Tamil Nadu to Kerala to West Bengal who are uh, on the ground helping people. Uh, we have given this name to ourselves as Red Volunteer. Uh, there, are, there are news reports which are terming us as uh, the guardian angel. Uh, but we are saying that, no, uh, Red Volunteer is our primary identity. Uh, we are going out to people. We are reaching out to people. We are helping them as much as possible for us. So, yes, there is a defeat. Uh, yes, for the first time, there will be a single member of the Communist Party or the uh, left inside the uh, Assembly of West Bengal. But even after that, uh, the streets still belong to us. Uh, the people, when the people need it is the left, it is their cadre, it is the red volunteer who, who are going and reaching them. So even if there is a defeat, our hope is not lost. And I think that was the uh, primary lesson that you have got from the Pari commune, uh, that even after a, a, a failed revolution, even after seven to 72 days of relentless struggle, uh, even after we could not uh, sustain that dream, uh, as Comrade said, that you know they have uh, they reached the heaven, they touched the heaven. They have given us a glimpse of how our future would be. But even after that, it was an unsuccessful attempt. But all those unsuccessful attempts give us the seed uh, for a better future, for a successful, uh, further more revolutions ahead. Uh, there are just two couple of things uh, I thought I'll, I'll mention. Maybe I'm not a, I'm not a uh, very a learned person to talk about very commun, but when, when I was going through the books, uh, there are a few things which uh, I thought uh, I, could, I could relate immediately. And I thought I'd, I'll, I'll share this with you. Uh, there was one thing uh, that uh, Marx wrote after the uh, field, uh, you know, Paris Commune, that, uh, you know, it's not only about seizing the power. It's not only about seizing the state, but you have to smash it. You have to break it. 
and every time i was reading the word smash and the word break uh, i was getting remembered of a very popular uh, web series which 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 was really popular among at least in my generation game of thrones uh, which was there in the netflix and also in it was uh, it was screened in hbo uh, so there is a favorite character of mine her name is daenerys stormborn targaryen she is a queen uh, who lost her kingdom uh, then she was uh, forcefully married to people uh, who you can say um, who are not civilized enough uh, it is more like a tribe the tribe which does not have a very structured hierarchy a tribe where the leadership does not pass with the with the, with the understanding of ancestral property or something but uh, whoever has the more power whoever can fight and win can get the you know the leadership of the gang or the uh, or the tribe so uh, this denaria stormborn targaryen a, a very young girl was married off to that tribe forcefully and then other uh, multiple events happen she realizes that uh, you know if if she has to change her fate if she has to change the world if she has to be happy she has to do certain certain things and uh, while while she learns why she uh, while she gangs up while she take all the people of that tribe together and while she march on towards her um, destiny uh, there are things that she does uh, so there are uh, you know dynasty there are kingdoms where slavery is still practiced she goes there with with her tribe with her people and she uh, she speak against the slavery she says that should not be anyone who is enslaved uh, she says that everyone who has a bondage in their hand needs to be you know uh, broken all the bondages need to be broken and she was famously called after that uh, the breaker of chains and from there on uh, she started building a bigger and bigger army and uh, the, the the biggest uh, dynasty she she wants to challenge and take the power from her so there will be one hand uh, one hand of the kings uh, uh, so he will be saying that you know uh, you, you have a dream i understand that but the thing is that that dream is it's, it's not a practical dream do you think you are the first one who is thinking uh, who is going to uh, stop the will you you know there are people who have tried it earlier but they have failed so denaria uh, respond to his, her hand that i don't want to stop the will i don't want to stop this will where one dynasty goes another dynasty come but the working class people the common people the mass remain as oppressed i want to break the will i want to smash the will and i thought somehow what uh, uh, you know marx and lenin and many of us who believe in socialism who believe in communism were dreaming together somehow my favorite character uh, in that in that uh, series were also giving the similar kind of vibe was giving that similar kind of idea though uh, the series went on in a different direction and her whole character got uh, you know uh, vilified etc i'm not going to that debate but i'm just uh, i was just i just uh, i thought i'll share uh, this one thought that came to me while i was reading it uh, and there are uh, there is few aspect which i think of the paris commune which still remain relevant there were four things that we have learned uh, from the paris commune in the 72 days that it survived the first was the disarming uh, so the police and the army were no more uh, no more were superior they were the people who were deployed as a more responsible as a more revocable uh, group of people and uh, this whole idea of disarming which they were able to do in 72 days is still so relevant that we see when the black lives matter the whole protest happened against the racism against the police killing against the police brutality in america this whole, whole question of disarming of the police the whole question of disarming of the army remains became so prominent became so important so uh, when we look back to paris commune when we look at the thing that they were trying to do uh, the kind of mechanism that they were trying to apply uh, and when you today see in 2020 2019 and 2021 even during those all black lives uh, matter protests we think that that same uh, arguments that say same demand that same vision remain extremely important and uh, i think that is that, that is one thing uh, which is important the second thing i thought uh, what also they could do on those 72 days is the secularization of the society uh, taking back the power from the church and making uh, the society where uh, it is not the religion or the clergy or the pope who is going to decide or who is going to control the state but it is the people it is people's will it is the people's democratic uh, wish and will how they want to live their life 
and when in india we talk about uh, you know secularization of state or secularization of society we have seen that from the time uh, the narendra modi's government the bjp has formed the government in india the basic fabric of sec- you know secular india has gone away the kind of hindutva fascism that uh, this government the bjp and the rss together is trying to push upon us the way they are trying to tear up this years of our uh, harmonious relationship with different religion with different culture and different norms i think it is very important that we take our lesson from the pari commune how they were successful in secularizing a society how they are able to make sure that it's the people uh, it's people's demand it's people's will uh, it, 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 it's the collective it's the mass which is going to be the primary uh, decision making body or or who is going to have the you know the ultimate power of how the state of how the country is going to run uh the third thing comrade uh, vijay prasad has already had spoken about the elective judiciary uh this whole sacrosanct idea that you know judiciary is neutral judiciary uh, whatever judiciary does uh, is is a, is a neutral thing it is not it is not biased it is unbiased but we have seen in case of india if you look at the judges if you look at uh, the lawyers if you look at the caste that they represent if you look at the class that they represent you will understand that it is not possible i mean individuals are by nature uh, are, are subjective and you cannot uh, really uh, believe that once they sit in a chair they will leave all their subjectivity and they will give you objective judgment and there have been multiple judgments that have seen in india which actually shows that uh, the kind of judiciary that we are having now without a reform uh, the the law uh, the implementation of it cannot be unbiased uh, there will be always the ruling class there will be always the people who are oppressed and judiciary more or less would be helping the people who are already in the, the privileged position in the ruling class and the fourth fourth and most important thing that i think uh, i have learned or understood from pari commune uh, pari commune from the very beginning was talking about broadening democracy uh, as marx wrote that at first this whole idea this whole exercise of pari commune started as a patriotic act uh, but it ended up as a more uh, radical as a as a more revolutionary uh, you know project and i think that you know when we talk about democracy particularly in indian context and there is a lot of halla uh, hangama around nationalism around patriot patriotism as an idea i think we need to uh, ask this question as as left activist we need to make this question more and more pertinent that what is our democracy what is the you know need of a parliament what is the need of a state if it does not belong to the people if it does not work for the people even uh, you know marx also had this uh, uh uh you know in his writing he has said that even inside when the parliamentary commune was happening there was a there was a sharp criticism of parliamentarism how parliament is going to be used whether it is going to be used for the people whether it is going to be a collective vice exercise or it is going to like the uh, previous time uh is going to serve the ruling class is going to serve the bourgeoisie so i think today when you look at parliamentary commune we should take our lesson uh, from the uh, from from all those seven to today on how they're able to ensure that the democracy reaches everyone how they're able to start in a it get uh, it get to the people and it's the people it's the collective it's the mass which get the ultimate power uh, on how democracy on how state on how a parliament or a country or a society at large will be running uh so i believe that was uh, my uh, take and my inspiration from uh, pari commune and just just a small note uh, i think uh, comrade vijay prasad was only telling that this idea of commune was not only you know safeguarded within uh, paris uh, it it went away it, it, it went to different different part of the country and it influenced people it uh, uh, it, it created different different commune in different parts i have heard uh, the story of commune from my grandfather so during the 72s when there was a semi fascist attack happening on different different uh, communist parties in west bengal my grandfather was uh, you know he had to leave home uh, for quite a year and that time he was living in a commune uh, a commune which was built in a place where we are a bit more stronger than the rest of the places and he was telling that how everybody is going to do everything so people will be cooking together people will be cleaning together people will eat together people will sleep together people will learn together i think this uh, idea of togetherness this idea of sharing responsibility the idea of sharing labor let it be a domestic labor or let it be a intellectual labor i think uh, this uh, this still remain as a major essence of uh, paris commune or any commune that has happened across the uh, country across the globe uh, uh, across the world 
so i believe uh, our generation has to take that essence of collectivism that essence of shared responsibility and shared labor uh, to us to our movements to our activism and i think uh, that's the only way that we can live up to uh, the glory the hope and the expectation of the paris commune thank you thank you so much comrade dipsita that was fantastic um i began by saying that we are meeting today on the 150th anniversary of the defeat of the paris commune but actually what you've underlined uh, is that the that the agenda that was you know set in motion by the paris commune is an agenda that is still an unfinished agenda it's an agenda for mm -hmm. the true democratization of of society right and uh, yeah. and that is something that you know bourgeois democracy is something uh, it's impossible for bourgeois democracy to uh, to fulfill that aspiration of the people that in fact mm -hmm. it is socialist democracy that will eventually fulfill this aspiration of the people that was a fantastic talk thank you so much dipshita uh, before i um, um, i close the evening uh, i'd like to invite all of uh, of the people who have worked together to make this evening possible to you know to turn on your videos um, and to remind our, uh, our viewers again that the book uh, that we are talking about paris commune 150 uh, is available on the website of mayday.leftward.com uh and uh, if you go down to the editor's pick then that's the book that is um is, is highlighted uh, there and um if you go to the uh, if you try to buy the book and use the coupon code paris commune uh on the checkout page you will also get a discount but of course you can also get a free copy of the book that's available for download at the at the website of tricontinental.org so so with this can i please ask everyone to turn on their videos uh, so that our viewers can see that it's uh, it's a team of people that has made this evening possible uh, purbasha priyanka vini junena uh, tings vijay dipshita um, and surangya uh, that's a wonderful team that has put together this evening thank you so much and once again Vive la commune 150 years uh, and we are going strong and the agenda of the commune is a live agenda it ended in defeat 150 years ago but we are not defeated we fight on thank you so much bye bye